Thank you for joining me for this episode. In Her Own Way is a space to create and spark conversations with women around the world who are living boldly. This podcast will offer new perspectives and status quo pushing thoughts from women who speak with heart, soul, and courage. What you do is not who you are. And that's a concept that mm. I had to keep reminding myself of because that's it, it had become such a big part of my life that I couldn't see myself as anything but a surgeon. All right, everyone, I have Nico on today, who I have been following because I might stalk (laughs) Dr. Nikki Stamp, who is um, a surgeon here in Perth, who is also pushing the status quo, and maybe one day I can have her on as well. But she shared um, your story, which went viral in the Sydney Morning Herald, um, about burnout and exhaustion in the medical profession, especially with junior doctors. And I have you on, I haven't actually talked about this a lot, but in January of this year, um, for my listeners who are listening, um, I had a full on visceral panic attack whilst walking into a former place of employment in a hospital setting. Um, I never understood a panic attack until I had one. Um, and then I thought, okay, just like you, Miko, super, super smart, super capable, you know, doing, I was, I read all of your blog posts about, you know, you were super regimented and taking care of yourself until you got in totally over your head and you had a really unsupportive work environment at the time. And I guess I want to talk to you about that journey and then also kind of how you've come out of that because it ruins people. If we don't talk about this, especially in the healthcare field with the loads, the patient loads is crazy town. Um, it's, it's, um, it's actually dangerous a lot of the times, but I would just love to just welcome you to the podcast. Sorry for that long inter- introduction. Thank you. <laughs> um, I love following you. I love you also because no one ever talks about this, you know, they don't do they? No, it's just something that we're expected to deal with and people don't really discuss it because they're worried that it might be a sign of weakness when when really it isn't. A lot of people talk about resilience training, but it really has nothing to do with resilience. No, it doesn't. It's with the workplace conditions that we're placed under. So that's something that I really want to reinforce. Totally. Resilience is not like working yourself 24 hours a day. That's not that's res- right. No, not like doing, you know, like working 18 hours, having two hours sleep and then rallying. That's not resilience. That's just a really dangerous cultural indoctrination. That's not resilient. So Miko, just tell us, um, I guess just start from, oh, I mean, the whole blog post is up on her blog and I will link that in the podcast, but maybe just tell us a bit about a little bit of your journey and then kind of what happened and kind of falling on. I want to ask you some questions around that as well. So last year I was in my eighth year of being a doctor and fourth year of being a plastics registrar. So it was something that I was already quite experienced in. But the first time that I was faced with a punishing roster that I couldn't cope with, um, there were just two registrars and normally you'd expect two people to divide the workload in half. But instead of me doing seven out of 14, every fortnight I was on call for 10 days a fortnight. So it was really unequal. And I was just made to work these long continuous hours of of being on call, which for people who don't know what on call is, it means that even if you're not at the hospital, you have to be answerable to anyone in the hospital who might need your advice or might need you to come back to review someone urgently. So you can't really relax, you can't plan anything, you're just on standby the whole time yeah. and you have to be close enough to the hospital just in case you do get called in. And, and you do get called in, yeah. but you just don't know when. So there's a lot of mental unrest with doing that kind of work. Um, so I was doing that for a few months, um, but already in the first month I knew that it was unmanageable. I was working 100 hours of overtime in the first month and I could just tell that even though I've done busy jobs in the past that this was much harder than what I'd done previously 
and uh, my physical health started to deteriorate as well. Yeah. So um, I was kind of in a desperate situation. Normally I would just do, do the job, not complain about it and just do it to the best of my abilities. But I came to a point where I had to go and see my GP about it and she even felt strong at uh, strongly about writing a letter to the hospital so she wrote a letter to the hospital and um, the other specialties even started to notice the amount of time I was doing there um, mm. people working night shifts were seeing me at the hospital at all hours of the night wondering what I was still doing there and even the the head of all surgical departments got involved and I just got to a point in June when I thought if the head of all surgery can't even get my department to change the roster, this is a hopeless situation. Nothing's going to change. Yeah. Exactly. And I, yeah, I always believe that if you're in a tough situation, you either have to make a change or remove yourself from it. And I did everything I could to make that change. Very I spoke good. to my supervisors. I even came up with um, a fairer roster um, and you know, my supervisors did think that I came up with some um, reasonable options, but none of them were taken up. And I just knew that after months and months of trying to, to change this roster, that it was never going to change. And I just couldn't put myself through it anymore. So I eventually resigned. And that was in June of last year. I am... Um they can't see me, but I'm just sitting here like rolling my eyes and shaking my head. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, people go into the medical profession because they want to help people, right? They want to service in a way or they want to grow in their career. Some of them would obviously go in it for money or ego. Let's be honest. But yeah. I would say a majority of people go into medicine because they have a genuine interest in serving and helping other people. And yeah when we are consistently given and doctors are consistently given and nurses are consistently given patient loads and work environments, which are completely toxic. It's unfair. Like I remember times when, um, I did it very rarely, but it would be like, Oh, can you work a late? So from one to nine 30 is a late for a nurse. And then can you pull an all nighter and work all the way until the next morning at seven 30 AM? So I would be at work from 1 p.m. on a Thursday until 7.30 a.m. on a Friday with, if I was lucky, I would have a mm. dinner break and maybe an hour sleep if we would have had time. But then I was never offered a taxi home. Mm. So here and I am driving home, after, yeah, driving home, being up for 24 hours. It's absolutely insane. Yeah. And the irony is we're in a profession where we care for other people and yet the people who employers don't care for us so it's a very hypocritical world that we live in totally and um it's it's just disappointing that doctors mm -hmm. don't look after each other yeah when that's what we do for a yeah. living every single day it's yeah. somehow it's different when it comes to your own colleagues yeah so it's, it's very disappointing. Now, the, yeah. other, the other thing that was interesting too, when you were talking about people noticing is that you had a patient who you'd see like, mm. every, and he was like the only person that kept you going was this man who, yeah. yeah. Every day actually. Oh, every yeah. Day. Every single day. Yeah. Um, it was such a poorly resourced hospital where I was not given any nursing support. So I did all the dressings and being a plastic surgery uh department you can imagine how many dressings that we do and oh, and, the, and the dressings um aren't aren't as simple as just whacking a band-aid on you know you have to clean things thoroughly there are different types of dressings different layers of dressings sometimes we use vacuum dressings and yeah. it, it can be quite technical and very time consuming but I wasn't offered any nursing support so that's why that's how I came about doing dressings every day for this man mm. and he was just such a lovely patient extremely supportive of me and would always ask me how I was um, I think as doctors and nurses we ask our patients how they're going they don't always ask us back how we we are but he always checked in checked in with me every morning mm. and that interaction was just so lovely it just kept me going yeah. and um 
yeah but but even he started to worry about me too because he's I think I had seen him for maybe the 20th day in a row and he he said you've seen me every day even on the weekends like don't you get a day off doesn't it affect your social life and your personal life he was just worried for me um but really if it weren't for him and also my uh, the medical student and and the intern on my team I don't know what would have kept me going but I was lucky that I did have a few people including that patient who were supporting me Mm, that's beautiful so it was interesting too in your blog post you talk about how throughout the time when you were kind of raising the white flag or raising the alarm bells like this isn't fair this isn't you know this is unjust you were trying to create you know different changes um I actually quoted this in the email that I sent you from what you'd said was Mm. stop being emotional. Yep. Wonderful. (laughs) It's such a shame that your talent will be wasted. Mm. Unbelievable. So as a woman in medicine, anyways, you're already climbing an uphill battle. Let's be honest. Although the facts are interesting, right? So I think is that 50% of women go into medicine or into medical school. But when it comes yeah, to like slightly more than that now, there are, there are more women than men in medical schools. But when it comes to registrars or consultants in surgery, it's drastic. Mm. Less. That's right. Yeah. So how do you, how have you come about now that you've, it's almost been a year now, by the time this goes live in May, it'll be almost a year since you yeah. have left. When you decided to leave on the 1st of June, 2018, and you're like, I'm out. I'm 150% out. I'm done. What were, yeah. some, what were some of the things that you had to work with in the immediate that you personally had to work mm. through emotionally? I mean, you've worked at this now for eight years. You've done medicine. You've done four right. years. You've done eight years of actual doctorate. Plus yeah. I would say, is it eight, six to eight years of school? Yes. Yeah, six years of school. Yeah. So you've done and 14 years of medicine. That's right. And this being a surgeon was something I wanted to do even before I entered medical school. I just had so many inspirational stories that motivated motivated me to want to be a surgeon and it's something that I held for such a long time and so it really does become a part of your identity mm. and it's what you do every single day. So my biggest... I guess emotional battle was to let go of that part of my identity Mm. and to to understand that what you do is not who you are and that's a concept that Mm. I had to keep reminding myself of because that's um, it it had become such a big part of my life that I couldn't see myself as anything but a surgeon yeah and to have to find other aspects of myself again were difficult and I have to say the thing that did help me the most was um, yoga and studying yoga philosophy. There's um, a concept uh, called aparigraha, which means disidentification. So to let go of things that you think make you you. Um, Ideas about power, ideas about possessions, Mm. things that are external to yourself, are things that we need to learn to detach from. And so studying that part of the philosophy really did help me, but it definitely took a long time to come to a point of acceptance because it's just some something that I work so hard towards. So much um, time was invested into to this dream of mine and I had people saying to me oh it's too soon to give up this is everything you've worked so hard for how can you just walk away from it but I just physically couldn't keep going so for me there was no other option I just thought if I keep going like this I'm, I'm going to to break down there's just no way I can keep going so um, it, it was like a grief reaction because it is a loss it's a loss of your career it's a loss of everything that you've done every day for the last however many years so I did go through something like a grief process. You go through anger, sadness, Mm. all of those emotions, and then finally coming to a place of acceptance. But Mm. it was a process that took a really long time. It took several months. And even now I sometimes feel sad about it, but I definitely don't regret walking away from it. 
Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Like now that you've had some dissonance, some space between the like raw emotion and exhaustion of that and where you are now. Um, what do you think you've learned most about yourself in the last um, time? I think the value that has come out the most is my integrity. Mm. That um, a lot of people will tell you, don't complain, but you know, what about the training program? This is going to affect your selection. This is going to affect your reputation. This is going to affect this and that. But my sense of integrity was stronger than any of that. So for me to be able to walk away and for me to be able to tell my story honestly, knowing what the risks were, I think taught me that I do have integrity and that's something that I strongly value in myself and in other people as well. When you, when the Sydney Morning Herald rang you or emailed you or Twittered or whatever they did to you, however they got in contact with you, what was your initial reaction? Were you like, yes, or were you like, yes, oh my God, what's going to happen? Um, <laughs> I, 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 it's not like you went small. It's not like you went to like, you know, the little tiny Shire paper that's like printed on, you know, like a cute little, yeah. like you went like it, the big guns, like you went big. I was... I was so shocked. <laughs> really? Because, yeah, because honestly, I before I posted my blog post on Facebook, I had 11 readers to my blog. <laughs> Not even joking. I had 11, and most of them were my family of five and six <laughs> friends. So I really was not expecting that many people to read it. Um, and I had... I think as part of the burnout experience, you become very socially withdrawn because you stop caring about the outside world and um, you just become a little bit apathetic. And so I had actually deleted my Facebook account. I didn't have Facebook, but I decided in February, just before the start of the new clinical year, that actually I think it's important that people read this story, um, especially with the new year starting I don't want other registrars to go through the same thing yeah. and also to 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 tell my junior colleagues that it's not as smooth or as glamorous as people describe it to be we see this kind of streamlined process of becoming a surgeon but it's actually a really hard path and um, with lots of obstacles in the way and some of them are invisible like being a female all of those things are invisible obstacles that you don't really see Mm. so I posted it on Facebook publicly but even when you post things on on public you just don't know who's gonna read it I mean I did tag the College of Surgeons and a few other medical bodies and 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 hashtag things like burnout and, and Dr. Burnout hoping that it will get picked up by the the tags but I really didn't expect it to go to mainstream media I really hope maybe a few extra people might read and relate yeah um so for the Sydney Morning Herald to to contact me I was really shocked I just didn't think it would get to that level of interest but I'm glad that it it, that it did because it's such an important issue for all health workers um Burnout is so prevalent among all health professionals and to be able to shine a light on it and put a face to it I think is is important because burnout's not a new issue. It's not a hot topic even though we're using the word a lot these days. I've, I've read articles about burnout from 20 years ago in, in medical journals and it's something that's been described for a long time. And we always hear statistics like, you know, this this percentage of doctors and this percentage of nurses have burnout, this this percentage of depression, this percentage have considered suicide. We always hear about numbers, but we never see the human face of what those numbers actually mean. So I think it was important to put a face and a human to the statistic because we all know that we're burnt out, but no one's ever put their face or name out there. And, And for good reason as well, because there are career repercussions with speaking out but for me I just I I stopped caring I thought well I've walked away from it now so I have nothing to lose 
So I had no, not, I had nothing hold, holding me back. So I'm and glad I, that I was able to. Yeah. Asked, when that went viral, what was, um, what was the response from the hospitals and the medical boards? Was it just radio silence? Was it um, any apology? Was it an open conversation? Was it, she's just a crazy female? Like what was the response from the medical bodies in, in um, as a, I had a lot of support from the medical association, the AMA. Yeah. Um, they even offered me some media advice. So they got me in touch with the media um, yes. person there, which was really useful because I'd never, oh. I'd never been involved with media before. And he gave me the best advice, which was to not read the comments because there are some people who will write nasty things and just to protect myself um, yeah. from any hate but luckily it was um overwhelmingly supportive and I think that it was great to see the outrage because it validated my experience yeah because at the time it it, I was made to feel like I was the one who was weak and I was the one who wasn't coping yeah um when I knew that you know this was my fourth year as a registrar I'd done harder terms before so I knew it wasn't me but I was made to feel like I was the one with the problem Mm. But when there was so much outrage regarding the conditions I was under, it, it made me feel like um, I, I did the right thing by talking about it and, and it wasn't about me. Um, yeah. And it also helped other unaccredited registrars as well who are going through the same thing realise that it's it's a problem with the system and it's not a problem with the individuals. Yeah. It's not to do with any weaknesses or personality flaws or lack of resilience we really have quite a wide systemic problem with how we're treating registrars especially unaccredited registrars so I think some important industrial issues came out of it and the College of Surgeons did um, take an interest in it and they did send out an email to all of the members regarding it and um the hospital eventually offered a um, public apology when it got identified because I didn't identify the hospital no, in my didn't. initial blog post, no, but it came out because obviously people had worked with me before last year, so it kind of spread that way. Um, but, yeah, I did get an email from the hospital, but only after the story went to the news. Until then, I'd not heard anything from them since I quit and they even had the audacity to say, oh, we thought you went home to Japan, um, which I found just, I was so shocked by that because Australia is my home. Like why would you say go home to where you came from kind of thing? You know, I am Japanese by blood, but I've been here for a long time. I went to high school here and uni and I've worked here for a long time. And for them to suggest that I would just fly home to Japan after all of that happened, uh, just I thought was extremely ignorant and just a really bad excuse for not getting in touch with me sooner. I mean, of course, they only got in touch with me after. Yeah, after their yeah. asses on the line. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. after um, <laughs> when they had yeah. a PR, when their PR nightmare, when their PR team was like, ah, yeah, they were like, thought, oh, uh, like, we'll send a little email. I think think, damage control. Yeah, exactly. I think you're really raising a really important question as we kind of, or a really important thought as we kind of end today, which is two things. Mm. One is that everyone's capacity to deal with certain amount of load is varied. And I think we need to stop thinking that like, if we can't handle what that person's handling, therefore our burnout isn't valid. It's like whatever, wherever you're experiencing burnout is your own journey, which is your own integrity. And I think for women, especially, especially with the online space, especially with like the entrepreneurial space, the doctor space, it's like, how much more can we take on? And then we're Mm. even, so like, kind of like what you talked about with the yoga thing, right? Where there's so much external markers of success now for women's quote unquote, and I heavily use the quotation success, that Mm. burnout has become in some ways is kind of like, um, trophy of how much we can handle when I think it's really, really unhealthy. And I think the other thing that you've done is not only have you said something, but you have bravely and courageously walked away from it. And there are so many people 
who wouldn't say anything or they would say something and then backtrack and then stay in the profession that's killing them mm-hmm. because yeah. there'd be so much fear that, um, that you would never get something else that you've wasted all of these 14 years. And for me too, yoga has been one of the most important integral parts of my recovery for an eating disorder and burnout and perfectionism, Mm -hmm. hands down, hands down, unequivocally. When you look at your recovery beyond yoga and beyond just bravely going, I wanted to ask you also, what did your family say? I mean, your family been supporting you now for 14 years through stuff. Yeah. Was that something you had to think about? Like, did you ever think I'm disappointing my parents or my parents will be upset with me? Did that ever cross your mind or it wasn't at all an issue? Absolutely. They they live in Tokyo. So Ah, I actually kept it a secret from them until until I was actually in hospital. Um, Because my health continued to deteriorate and I was hospitalized in October. And I just just didn't have the heart to tell them until then. Um, I was worried that I was disappointing them wow. and they would say, oh, come on, you can do it. You know, they, they've always kind of cheered me on no mm-hmm. matter how tough things are that they know that I'm tough and I could keep going. But I, I couldn't tell them until October. Wow. But I thought that if I FaceTimed them from a hospital bed, maybe they might forgive me. So and maybe they might understand that I actually worked too hard and that's why I had to quit. But they were so, so accepting of it. And it was actually my father who who I thought I would disappoint the most. I was so scared of telling him. But he was the one um, who said to me, well, you used to love teaching anatomy. Why don't you go back to academia? Mm. And so that was such a relief to hear that from him. Mm-hmm. Um, that that it was okay for me not to pursue the path that I'd been pursuing for such a long time. And that that is what I hope to do in the long term, to go back to uni and be involved in education because I am passionate about education. And yeah. if I can nurture the next generation of doctors to be more compassionate and do that through being a university lecturer, I think that that's a very rewarding thing to do. And it's it might... Yeah, it might not be the the same kind of joy you get from interacting with patients and helping them get better, but it's still something that I think I'll find meaning meaningful. And for me, it doesn't matter what I do, as long as I enjoy what I do and that I do something with purpose. And I, I see that in education. So that's what I, I hope to end up doing. I've, isn't that amazing, even as like an adult professional? <laughs> Mm-hmm. You don't want your parents to be like, it's okay. Like, it's just so, yeah. funny. It's so funny. Like I'm 36 and I'm like, I still seek that approval. And like, it kind of made me teary. Cause I would imagine if that was my daughter, you know, thinking, oh, I can't tell mom for six months. And then I would be like, honey, do whatever you want. Like go be a greeter at Target or like go make coffees at a cafe. Like whatever brings you joy is whatever brings me joy. But yeah, I can imagine that would be really hard. Like to, to have to say that to them for sure. I love how you, um, I love how you've spun this into something where it's like, I can teach compassion and Mm. tips on how to remain. It'd be interesting too. I don't know the stats, the interesting too, on like the levels of addiction and depression and anxiety and medical professionals, because I know it would probably be quite high. I know it is with with lawyers for sure. Yeah. Um, so where are you at now? And what do you see yourself in the next 12 months? And then as we end today, um, where can people connect with you? Um, where am I now? So at the moment, I've, I've got quite a few speaking engagements. So I'm doing a lot of speaking and writing this year. So I've got about 15 different conferences and they've all got different um, thing, themes that they focus on. So some are about mental health and burnout. Some conferences are about medical leadership. Yeah. Um, others are about compassion. Um, some are about women in medicine or women in surgery. So a few themes have come out of, I think, the discussions um, that came out of the blog. So and I'm talking about... Look, I just yeah. I interrupt you really fast. Um, yeah, look at like yeah. what you've been gifted. You know, yeah. like... Even a year ago, a year ago, you were still in the throes of changing someone's dressing 20 days straight, you know, like you <laughs> hadn't even left your job yet. 
Yeah, at all. That's right. You know, you'd have yeah. six more hell weeks of doing what you were doing last year, just totally fried. And now because you stand so courageously, because you enforce boundaries, because you put yourself first, because you decided to be brave against a system that was so negative, it's, I always feel like when we are brave and we are integral in what we do, we are always gifted things that we would have never even dreamed of. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't and have imagined this. One of the conferences I'm excited about is coming up next month. It's the National Leadership Development Seminar, which I actually attended as a delegate, as a student. Mm-hmm. So to be able to go back 12 years later as a speaker, to, to open the conference is something that really oh, excites me. That's so and awesome. Yeah, I would have been sitting in that very auditorium 12 years ago waiting to be inspired by these speakers and now I get to go back and speak to the next generation. So that's a really lovely um, kind of full circle thing that I'm looking forward to. So good. And and I am also writing a book. Um, I was a post approached by some book publishers and um, I'm in the process of um, deciding which publisher to go with and to, to write about my, yeah, to write about my story. So I, I, I never even dreamt I would be a writer. In fact, when I was in year 10, when I was in year 10 um, at the parent teacher night, my English teacher told my mum that I wasn't gifted in English. So... <laughs> Um, so to now be able to say I'm writing a book is really um, is something I never would have imagined for myself. But in reading my blogs, I feel so mm. lucky that some publishers saw a bit of talent in writing and that I had a story to tell. So um, mo- most of this year will be spent writing my book about what the last 10 years have been like. How do you stay centered every day? Uh, I'm, I'm lucky that I'm very close with my family despite them being really far away and, mm-hmm. and some really good friends. Um, meditation definitely helps. Yeah, I, I can't say that I'm as dedicated to it as I'd like to be. Yeah. Um, I'm still f- trying to find the right type of meditation for me. I've tried Japa meditation and chakra meditation and I enjoy them both but it is hard to kind of get in the zone it's yeah. it's funny because meditation is supposed to help you get in the zone but <laughs> I find that I need to get in the zone to be able to meditate so yeah. kind of balancing that um but when I do give myself that time that medit even if it's not um exactly meditation but to allow myself to be in a meditative state even if it's doing something mindfully like cooking um Mm -hmm. just to do mindful activities definitely keeps me centered and I think removing myself from the busy hospital environment helps just going somewhere quiet sitting in a park or going to the beach or going somewhere quiet like that definitely helps to center me I just can't imagine right now going back to a hospital with, you know, carrying a pager that beeps every few minutes and listening to monitors and beeping and people yeah. and yeah, just to be away from that chaos in itself has helped me find a kind of a more quiet center. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on me though. I think that, I think that although it's um, slanted towards the medical side, obviously, and that's why I wanted to have you on for mm-hmm. one I can totally identify with, um, well, I can identify with where you're at in a different context with the same outcome. Um, Mm. but I think I'm so excited. I guess my, I guess my excitement is I'm so excited that we're hopefully raising a generation of nurses and doctors, physios, dietitians who are going to revolt against this kind of indoctrination. And I really hope that it starts to kind of make um, some co- really hard conversations around workload, patient loading, patient mm. outcome, et cetera. Um, when we have rested, <laughs> joyful yeah. medical practitioners serving patients, um, we have, we would have way less issues, um, mm. holistically. And I love also what you have brought today about this idea of living with integrity and boundaries and bravery and courage, because when we make courageous steps, 
I truly feel like the universe always rewards us in ways that we had never Mm -hmm. expected. And now your story is going to be used to just help so many people find freedom and joy. And to me, that is just like amazing. So congratulations on this last year of recovery for you. Thank you. Yeah. I think just one last thing. I think that um, it will take time for the system to change. Cultural things, institutional changes, they all take a really long time. But I think that um, even if it's just one person at a time, we can make a difference. Um, For example, um, one girl who's also from an Asian background was also leaving surgery and she just had no idea how to bring this up in conversation with her parents. So she sent my blog post to her parents and her parents read it and it it helped her parents understand why she was leaving and it helped her um, have that conversation with her parents. And now she's moved on to do something that fulfills her more and makes her happier. Mm -hmm. And so even if it's just individuals, um, if I can help people find their selves again through um, a profession or a purpose that serves them better and aligns more with their values. I think that's, that's enough for me. But if it so happens that there are institutional changes that come out of it, that, that would be really great. That's something that I'm hoping for in the future. It'll take time, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it will happen. I think it will happen. I think it will happen because people will just keep leaving and then they'll have no senior staff left, you know, <laughs> like, well, why do we have all these junior staff? <laughs> like, because yeah. they don't want to be flogged anymore. And that's not why people got into it. So I love it. We go, where can people find you? How can people contact you? Or you're on Instagram? Yes, I'm on Instagram. Um, it's Mind Body Miko. Um, I'm on Facebook as well under the same name. Yeah. And um, through either of those pages, um, I, I do check my messages and I try to answer back as quickly as possible. So, I mean, that's how we got in touch as well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. 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 so, so I, I do try my best to reply to people and I do check them. So if you'd like to get in touch, that's, that's the best way. Thank you so much for your time. And I cannot wait to see what you create. And I'm so excited for everyone to be able to hear you. I think it's just such an important story. So thank you again. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. I just want to let you know something really cool and that I have spent a lot of time redoing all of my coaching packages. So you can check them all out on my website, mishpope.com. I have a brand new package called No Frills Reboot 60, which allows you to create your coaching contract without all the fluff, the bonuses, and all the extra stuff that you may not want, but all the coaching for you. I also have an in-depth life strategy coaching package, which is for you who wants all the juicy support, all the extra support, the bonuses. I'm added in yoga uh, videos for you. It's really a four month deep dive with a ton of extra support from me. You have me at your fingertips all the time. And lastly, for those of you who'd like to really learn about um, your strengths and your zone of genius, I have a 90 minute strengths and talents call. So go to my website, mishpope.com and click on the life coaching tab for all the updated life coaching packages. I would love to connect with you. 